Okay. Okay. This is my very good friend, Debbie, Debbie Tooth. Uh, uh, thank, thank you. Uh, okay. And uh, let me, before Deb brings God's word, she's an outstanding Bible preacher and teacher. And so she's going to serve us and bless us, I'm sure, this morning. But let me just, as a way of introduction, to explain that Debbie is on our staff team. She's our senior operations manager. And she, um, she's remarkable. Okay, she's outstanding. <laughs> You've got to preach after this. Yeah, thanks for that. We have really set that bar uh, she high. She oversees well. so much of what we do as a church family. She put ups with me, and she's a great blessing. Uh, so, Debs, thank you for all that you do for us, and um, over to you. Thanks. Welcome, Debbie Tooth. Bless Shelley. you. Hi, everybody. Good morning. I'm just going to recover from the blushes. Um, are we all well? Yes. Good. I am also well, thank you for asking. Um, although many of you all know it's just been half term um, and we were not well <laughs> during half term. We had a sickness bug that started last Saturday night with our youngest, moved through my husband and I and then hit our eldest on Wednesday night. Um, and I tell you this not just for sympathy, although I will take that. I tell you this because there is a real irony in us having had the week we just had when I had already prepared the preach I'm about to share with you. Um, and you will soon find that, probably in about 10 to 15 minutes' time. <laughs> but, praise God, we are here, we are well, and I get to share this message with you this morning. So, thanks for having me. Um, we are jumping back into a series, Jesus Meets, it's stories of uh, Jesus encountering people in the New Testament. And today we're doing Jesus Meets a Woman at the Well. And we're going to go straight into our Bible verse. We're reading from John chapter 4, verse 1, and then onward. Okay. The words will come up on the screen behind me if you want to follow along. Jesus knew the Pharisees had heard that he was baptizing and making more disciples than John, though Jesus himself didn't baptize them, his disciples did. So he left Judea and returned to Galilee. He had to go through Samaria on the way. Eventually, he came to the Samaritan village of Sychar, near the field that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired from the long walk, sat wearily beside the well at about noontime. Soon, a Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Please, give me a drink. He was alone at the time, because his disciples had gone into the village to buy some food. The woman was surprised, for Jews refused to have anything to do with Samaritans. She said to Jesus, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. Why are you asking me for a drink? Jesus replied, If you only knew the gift God has for you and who you are speaking to, you would ask me and I would give you living water. But sir, you don't have a rope or a bucket, she said, and this well is very deep. How would you get this living water? And besides, do you think you're greater than our ancestor Jacob who gave us this well? How can you offer better water than he and his sons and his animals enjoyed? Jesus replied, Anyone who drinks this water will soon become thirsty again, but those who drink the water I give will never be thirsty again. It becomes a fresh, bubbling spring within them, giving them eternal life. Please, sir, the woman said, give me this water. Then I'll never be thirsty again, and I won't have to come here to get water. Go and get your husband, Jesus told her. I don't have a husband, the woman replied. Jesus said, you're right. You don't have a husband, for you have had five husbands, and you aren't even married to the man you're living with now. You certainly spoke the truth. Sir, the woman said, you must be a prophet. So tell me, why is it that you Jews insist that Jerusalem is the only place of worship, while we Samaritans claim it is here at Mount Gerizim, where our ancestors worshipped? Jesus replied, Believe me, dear woman, the time is coming when it will no longer matter whether you worship the Father on this mountain or in Jerusalem. You Samaritans know very little about the one you worship, while we Jews know all about him, for salvation comes through the Jews. But the time is coming, indeed, it is here now, when true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. The Father is looking for those who will worship him that way. For God is spirit, so those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know the Messiah is coming, the one who is called Christ. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus told her, I am the Messiah. Just then, his disciples came back. 
They were shocked to find him talking to a woman, but none of them had the nerve to ask, what are you doing with her or why are you talking to her? The woman left her water jar beside the well and ran back to the village, telling everyone, come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could he possibly be the Messiah? So the people came streaming from the village to see him. This is the word of God, church, and I believe it. Do you believe it? Yes. Good. Then we're on a good start. Um, in this story, we meet a woman who doesn't know who Jesus is, and she doesn't really know who she is either. But Jesus, <clears throat> sorry, Jesus gently leads her into truth. This is the longest recorded private conversation with Jesus in the Bible, and it is the first person in the book of John who Jesus chooses to reveal himself to as the Christ. It is a story of how Jesus will cross every barrier to find us. And I suspect that we will each be able to see something of our own stories within her story. The very first thing that happens in this story is that Jesus seeks her out. It might seem like an accidental meeting at a well, uh, but Jesus is always intentional. And certainly he is here because Jesus seeks us out. He leaves the 99 to go and find the one. Jesus is on a journey from Judea to Galilee, and the Bible tells us that he needed to or had to go through Samaria. Now, if I can have my map. Thanks, Matty. Love a map. You might say, well, yeah, because it's in the middle, Debbie, and it's in red. It's quite a clear direct line up, wouldn't it? Judea to Galilee. But this is not the route most commonly traveled by Jews. When we hear Samaritan, we might think of the good Samaritan, a hero who saves the day and helps man. But the Samaritan and the Jews were enemies. It helps us in both the Good Samaritan story and this story if we can understand the racial tensions that existed between these two people groups. Samaria was infamous for its idolatry. It was a place in the Old Testament where Ahab had built his altar to Baal, and it was originally established and founded by the Israelites before the king of Assyria um, took it, and he removed about 20,000 Israelites out of their home in Samaria. And they were then replaced, it was repopulated with imported settlers from lots of different areas. So a whole bunch of Gentiles from around the area moved in and they brought with them their own cultures, their own beliefs, their own gods, their own ways of doing things. And then those people uh, married, intermarried with the Israelites who had remained. And it meant that the Israelite faith in Samaria got twisted in to these other beliefs and into these other patterns of doing things. So the Jews outside of Samaria looked at them as idolatrous people who didn't really believe the true faith. When some of the Israelites returned to rebuild Jerusalem, they were met by opposition from none other than the Samaritans. And in fact, the Israelites later destroyed the Samaritan temple at Mount Gerizim. This is so much more than Samaritans and the Jews don't like each other. You know, I think we can lower it to that level sometimes when we read these stories. The Samaritans in the Jewish context were an ungodly people with a violent past. We know this pattern of conflict. We see it in our modern day. Wherever racial and ethnic barriers divide people, this tension exists. And this is the environment that Jesus is walking into. And because of this, the Jewish people at the time, as I said, would have taken a different route. So I can have my second map, Matty. I mean, it is a much longer route, but the most recorded route for this journey for a Jewish person would have been to literally go the entire way around the edge of Samaria, to avoid it entirely. But Jesus has chosen to take an unlikely path in order to encounter an unlikely evangelist. The context makes this all the more astounding that he would seek this particular woman out. This is Jesus, who by this point has preached to multitudes, but here he is coming for the one. When he needs to go through Samaria, he's not looking for a shortcut. He is looking to, for a disciple. Jesus will cross every divide to find the lost. And maybe you can see yourself in this bit of the story. We know that he didn't come to heal the healthy or to save the holy. We know that Jesus came for people like you and like me. He carves unlikely routes to find unlikely evangelists for his glory. And aren't we glad he does, church? Amen? The Bible tells us there is nowhere we can go where God won't find us. In Psalm 139, verses 7 to 12, it says, 
Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there, your hand will guide me, your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely, the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like day, for darkness is as light to you. Jesus seeks us out. Wherever we are, wherever we run to, he finds us because he wants us. And then Jesus sends us out. Jesus may have been alone when the woman found him at the well, but he hadn't traveled there alone. He had gone with the disciples. And you better believe the disciples did not want to take this route directly through. That is not something they were up for. But Jesus said to them, this is the route we have to take. Because he was intent on encountering the woman, and he was intent that they should learn to encounter the Samaritan people. Where is God sending us right now? Maybe God is calling you to go to a place that you don't want to be, to be in relationship with people that you'd rather avoid. Who are the people? Where are the places that we have decided, oh, God doesn't want me to go there? If we truly want to be citizens of heaven, we have to learn to recognize our own prejudices and get past them, allowing God to reshape our hearts for his lost children in this world. Now, even if this root um, hadn't been an unlikely route for Jesus to take, what happens next in the story is nothing short of shocking. Jesus, by this point in his ministry, known widely to be a Jewish holy man, and the woman would have recognized him as such. Can you imagine? She is walking up to the well to get her water, and as she gets closer, she sees a man, a lone man, sitting by the well, and she is alone. And I can tell you as a woman, if I am walking somewhere alone and I see a man at the point I'm aiming at, I'm going to get a little nervous, maybe a little scared. But as she gets closer, she recognizes not only is he a lone man, he is a lone Jewish man. And then she may recognize from his clothing, his appearance, that he is a lone, holy Jewish man, a rabbi perhaps. What a bizarre thing for her to encounter as she goes to get her water. The expectation of a Jewish rabbi at this time would be that he wouldn't have engaged in conversation with a woman alone and in public. He certainly wouldn't have engaged in conversation with a lone Samaritan woman. But Jesus doesn't just entertain a conversation with her. He invites her in to conversation with him. Isn't that glorious? In this one moment, racial, gender, political, religious barriers, Jesus just crosses them all. He approaches her. I think sometimes we don't understand this context and therefore we lose just how radical Jesus was in his approach to people. It's incredible. Our Lord remains a radical God. But as Jesus encounters her, he finds her blinded by her circumstance. She's like a horse with blinkers on. Now, I realize that may be a very British reference. <laughs> so, <laughs> to be clear, <laughs> horses, when they are um, like racing or working horses, will often have these things put over their faces, and they remove the peripheral vision. They're literally placed kind of here. So they are focused in on the task at hand. And she here is focused on just one thing. When Jesus tells her of his living water, her thinking is so focused on her earthly circumstance that she misunderstands him time and time again. Where's your bucket, she says. Where's your rope? And when he says that he can give her a bubbling spring from within and she'll never be thirsty again, her response is, great, I won't have to trudge up here every day. She, he is offering salvation and eternal life and the spirit, and she is missing it completely. She is focused on on the earthly, on the physical. But he is trying to lift her eyes to the eternal. They're talking at cross odds because she is so focused here and he is so focused here at the kingdom of God. But when Jesus exposes her shame, when he tells her the story of her husband's, she begins to move her thinking of him from a rabbi to a prophet. She still hasn't quite got it. She's misunderstanding him again. And he is patient with her like he is patient with us. Thank you, Lord. But she is getting closer. Early believers, on hearing this story, would have already been very suspicious of this lady, um, long before her past is exposed. Why was she alone at the well in the middle of the day? 
Visiting the well would have been a communal activity. The women would have gathered together from a community and travelled to the well in the earlier hours of the morning before the heat of the day had set in. And yet, here she is alone in the midday heat. Why? Well, this story is often told with the detail that the woman is an adulterer, but that information actually isn't given to us. We don't know what happened to her past marriages. We don't know what is happening in her current relationship. We know that for a woman at this time to be alone would have been an incredibly difficult circumstance. But we don't know why she's not married to the man she's with now. I think it's because it's not the detail that matters here. It might be the one that our like, enjoyment of gossip draws us in a bit. But it's not the thing to focus on. What we need to draw our attention to is that she has become isolated from her community through shame. Her understanding of herself is trapped entirely within this story. Uh, there's a Christian author, Bob Goff, who wrote a very good book called Everybody Always. And he has a line in it that says, shame makes people leave safe spaces. And that has stuck with me since the moment I read it. It completely transformed the way I parent. It has affected the way I relate to people within all of my relationships. And I believe that the church should be a safe space. So I believe that there is no space for shame in this people. Rather, those who are heavy with sin and with mistakes and shame should come into the church and they should find forgiveness and grace, a better life on offer to them with a great saviour who tells us that his yoke is easy and his burden is light. There may be sacrifices in the Christian walk, yes, yes, but there isn't shame. There is freedom. Shame makes people leave safe spaces. And this is exactly what's happened to our Samaritan woman. She has been cast out from her community, isolated through shame, and now she's alone in the middle of the day. Whether her shame is of her own doing or not really doesn't matter. We can experience shame because of our sin, yes, absolutely. But we can also experience shame by believing lies about ourselves, whether they come from society, culture, the devil, wherever. And I know that kind of shame. When my first daughter was born, uh, I was unable to breastfeed her, and I felt incredible shame over that situation. I remember as the midwife pulled the curtain around us to tell us, you need to go right now and buy your baby formula. What I heard was, we're going to pull this curtain because your shame shouldn't be seen by all the other mothers and fathers who are weighing their babies in this room. And when the letter arrived from the hospital with a referral for failure to thrive for our daughter, what I heard was, you have failed to mother your daughter and you should be ashamed. And this message was reinforced time and time again. Do you know, you can't get um, points on a store card, a store card if you're buying infant milk, first milk. And that time and time again, medical staff will tell you and have told me that breast milk was the best thing for my baby. It would give her the best start and it would build up her immune system. And that's all true. But nobody ever said to me from the medical community, well done, you did what you needed to do so that your baby would survive. I had failed as a mother, and I carried so much shame and a world of sterilizing equipment <laughs> everywhere I went. I was quite literally an emotionally heavy laden, but nothing about that shame was true. Nothing about it. And Jesus broke through my shame with truth. I am a good mum. I am. <laughs> and in his immeasurable kindness, he has gifted me with a daughter who has an immune system that rivals every breastfed peer. And here is the irony of the week that we have just had. <laughs> but I tell you, as Lydia was being sick, bless her, she turned around to my husband Richard and I and went, but I'm Lydia. <laughs> like, she, even she knows this is bizarre. She doesn't get sick. I don't think that girl has genuinely been sick in over five years. It's incredible. Every member of our family has COVID, had had COVID except for her. She's never had it. She just doesn't normally get sick. And it is a gift of God and his grace to our family. I was stuck in my circumstances. I had my blinkers on and my eyes were focused on my physical experience and the lie of shame weighed me down. It took years, and I mean years, before I could take that shame into the light of Christ and find freedom from it. But thank God I did. And this is what happens with our woman at the well. Jesus doesn't condemn her. He is exposing her need for a saviour. 
And this is what he does for us. He wants to bring our struggles out into the light, not to shame or condemn, but to give us freedom from them. But even still, she remains focused on earthly concerns. She starts to ask him, well, where should I worship? She wants to know, what do I do with my sin and my shame? Where do I take this? Do I go to a priest? Do I do a sacrifice? You say, go there, but my ancestors worshipped here. Where should I go? Again, I think this is a story some of us know, that feeling of um, recognizing our sin and our shame, but not knowing how to rid ourselves of it, what to do with it. But here's what Jesus tells her. It doesn't matter where you worship. It matters who you worship. It doesn't matter where you go. It matters who you go to. God wants our hearts. He wants our honest worship of our whole selves, a life laid down to him. And the woman starts to understand. She says, I know the Messiah is coming, the one who is called Christ. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus told her, I am the Messiah. Now her eyes are opened. And her understanding moves again, but this time from prophet to saviour. And she is transformed in an instant. Because Jesus brings freedom and Jesus brings transformation. And after she encounters Christ, what changes about her physical needs? Nothing. Nothing has changed. She remains a Samaritan divorced woman in need of water. But her view of the world and of herself is entirely changed, utterly transformed. She is no longer defined by her circumstance. She is now defined by her God. I love the detail in the text that she leaves behind her bucket. The thing that had consumed all of her thoughts until now had been the physical, the earthly. But here in this moment, when she runs back to her community to tell them about Jesus, she no longer cares. She leaves her water jar behind at the well. And they listen to her, and they come streaming to see Jesus. Just dwell on that for a second. A community that had rejected her, a community that had isolated her, now hears her, believes her, and then acts on it. Physically, she must have looked transformed. Have you ever seen a person who is carrying the weight of the world on their shoulders? They hunch, their face drains, everything is is down about them. And when that weight is lifted, they are lifted. This is all I can imagine for her. She must have looked entirely different. The word of a woman in that time, it didn't carry weight. In a court of law, it wouldn't have been valued But here, of all the women to believe, they take her word as truth and they ask Jesus to stay with them. Later in verse 39, it says, Many Samaritans from the village believed in Jesus because the woman had said, He told me everything I ever did. Did he tell her everything she ever did? No. No, he told her one thing. But that one thing was the thing that consumed her. It ruled over her heart, her mind, and her life. And he gave her freedom from the shame that felt to her to be all that her life was about. And then, because of this unlikely evangelist, a community meets Jesus and they believe. Verse 40 continues, When they came out to see him, they begged him to stay in their village. So he stayed for two days, long enough for many more to hear his message and believe. They said to the woman, now we believe, not just because of what you have told us, but because we have heard him ourselves. Now we know that he is indeed the saviour of the world. This is exactly what Martin was talking to us about recently, about making disciples. When one person knows Jesus and they take him and his disciples into their community and they share him. They take him to their workplace, on the school run, to the gym, to the barbecue. And they show people what a transformed life looks like. Because you don't encounter Jesus and leave unchanged. That is how disciples are made. So, I'm sorry, my stomach just rumbled. Did anyone hear it? Okay, great. <laughs> I did eat a biscuit literally before I walked up here for fear of this moment. Um, what does all of this tell us about Jesus? Can I have my next? Hey. Well, firstly, it tells us that he sought us out from every unlikely corner and that you don't get to count yourself out of God's chosen people. 
It doesn't matter who you are, where you have come from, or what you have done. Jesus has grace and he has salvation for you. He wants you. Secondly, it tells us that he knows us completely. All our hidden shame and he wants us. And thirdly, that he confronts sin, yes, so that we can experience grace and freedom, not shame or condemnation. Sin it needs to be addressed, yes. And lives need to be transformed, yes. And God will do both those things. But this is a beautiful gift. The gift of freedom is something that is joyous and lifting. It's not a weight for us. When sin is confronted, we find freedom. So how do we as Christians respond to this? What does this do for us in the weeks ahead? Well, firstly, we should seek out the lost. Whoever they might be, wherever they might be, where is our Samaria? Where is God telling us to go? We need to go. Secondly, we should be people who bring true freedom from sin and not shame. There's been a lot of talk in recent years of freedom. As we went through the whole COVID pandemic, there was a lot of rallying cries for my freedom. And I think the world tells us that freedom is the right to make my own choices for my own life. And I don't think that's what the Bible tells me freedom is. I think true freedom is when we lay down our lives in service of our God and in service of one another. Self-sacrificial love. That is true freedom, and that is radically different to the message the world is giving. This is something that we get to bring into the world that is different and beautiful and freedom. We should be people who bring true freedom. And thirdly, we should be transformed. We should be living transformed lives. I cannot get over how transformed this woman was. Just by her one encounter with Christ, in a moment she was changed from an outcast denied by her community to a voice that people believed could direct them to the saviour of the world. I mean, that is a full 180. I don't know about you, but I am challenged not to walk away from Jesus ever without having been changed by him. Let's seek to be changed. Let's seek to be made a little bit more like Christ with every encounter we have with him. Through our worship today, I hope you have been lifted. I hope you've been reminded that you were sought out. Through this talk, I hope you've been reminded that Christ has sought you out and sent you out. He chose us. He is sending us out to share him with a hurt world. Be transformed again today. And let's take this with us as we leave. Thank you very much, guys.